The deal that will be unveiled in less than a week will not be enough to keep us safe. In fact, it will be extraordinarily dangerous. We know from doing the math and adding up the targets that the major economies have brought to Paris that those targets lead us to a very dangerous future. They lead us to a future of between three and four degrees Celsius warming. We know that the deal that will be unveiled um, at the end of the week, on the weekend, is going to steamroll over crucial scientific red lines. We also know from the paltry levels of financing that wealthy governments have brought to the table that it is also going to steamroll over equity red lines, which means that wealthy countries um, that have been emitting fossil fuels on an industrial scale for a couple hundred years will continue to fail to do our fair share of emission reductions. We also know that it's going to steamroll over our legal red lines because the US has come to these negotiations announcing that the deal cannot be legally binding. Any talk of penalties was off the table before it even began. Um, which is why on December the 12th at 12 o'clock, that's 12, 12, 12, many activists will be in the streets of Paris peacefully demonstrating against the violation of these red lines. We will also... <laughs> we will also be mourning the lives already lost to climate disruption, in solidarity with the lives lost to the tragic attacks here in Paris, and enlarging that circle of mourning. By taking to the streets, we will be clearly and unequivocally rejecting the Hollande government's draconian and opportunistic bans on marches, protests, and demonstrations. We will be rejecting the shameful preemptive arrests of climate activists, the unprecedented restrictions on civil society inside the COP, the restrictions on free speech and movement, because liberté is not just a word, and it doesn't just apply to Christmas markets and football matches. There's a growing sense, I believe, in the social movements that it's time for us to struggle against our own ambition deficit not just the ambition, the lack of ambition from our political leaders. If we look at the Paris talks, the goals and principles of our movement, our movements, including the trade unions, has been confined to a bracket or a preface that no one will read. We believe that the only way, the only realistic chance of getting to science-based targets over the next 20, 30, 40 years is for a qualitative expansion of social ownership and democratic control over the energy systems, over energy infrastructure, energy options, and energy uh, generation. One of the main parts of this crisis is related to the extraction. So yes, fossil, fossil fuels, but also the extraction of water and the large-scale production, production of uh, agro-industrial products. People are being affected everywhere by that, and we see uh, different communities being displaced, the territory is being polluted and contaminated. And mainly, that is to deepen and reinforce the uh, mining industry, the extraction industry, and in order to solve the energy needs from the north. People and places have been sacrificed so that our economies could be powered by fossil fuels. And those are the communities, indigenous communities, communities of color that are dealing with the cancer and the asthma um, of the fossil fuel-based economy that need to be first in line for public money to own and control their own renewable energy projects. We want to start, to start by democratizing energy. Germany is a good example on this. In seven years, Germany has turned an energy market dominated by just four big corporations into one in which two million citizens are suppliers, and 190 towns and cities taking their local grids into democratic social ownership. 
The democratization of energy creates new and secure jobs for the many. Three quarters of all jobs in Germany's energy transition are now involved in turning homes into energy zero buildings. On the other hand, we can see the corporations are finding more and more areas, more spheres to increase their rights. And those are the free trade agreements, the investment agreements. And now a big Swedish uh, company is suing the German government under one of these investor right clauses for 4.7 billion euros. It's one of the biggest such trade challenges. And there are dozens of them where good green policies are being challenged using various trade deals. The US has challenged China and India at the World Trade Organization. Keep this in mind, because while these politicians all point the fingers at each other at summits like this about you're not doing enough, you're not ambitious enough, it's your fault, no, it's your fault, these same governments then go to the World Trade Organization and try to knock down each other's windmills. It is insane and it has to stop. Today in Britain, there are furious floods. The towns in the northwest of Cockermouth, Keswick and Carlisle are being flooded yet again and much damage has been done, houses are being lost, businesses are being lost and people are put at serious risk. These floods, these storms are consistent with scientific warnings of the effect of global warming of unpredictable storms that will happen in Britain as indeed will happen in many other parts of the world. Last year, the British Prime Minister promised that there was money is no object in dealing with flooding. Itself is a consequence, I believe, of the destruction of our environment. But this has proved to be a false promise. Last year, our government slashed spending on flood defences and looks like it might do that again. Since 2009, Cameron had... Um uh, laid off thousands of workers at the Environment Agency, which is the agency tasked with dealing with floods. In 2012, The Guardian revealed that nearly 300 flood defense schemes across England had been left unbuilt due to government budget cuts, right? Um, so you know, this is a very clear example of how the logic of austerity is completely incompatible um, with what we need to do in the face of just the impacts of climate change, let alone getting off fossil fuels, which requires you know, a whole other level of investments um, in energy and transit and so on. Come on, this is the labor movement. This is one of the biggest, the largest, the most democratic movement in the world that we can find at this point in time. Then why is it that we are not doing enough for climate change. I would say, uh, add to that, you know, why isn't the climate mo movement doing enough on labor, doing enough on migration, doing enough on racism? Um, the oil and gas industry was creating so many well-paying jobs and they were the only ones doing it, right? This was the problem, is that when we were having these debates about green jobs versus pipelines, it was a debate between actual jobs that the oil and gas industry was putting on the table and notional jobs that no one was putting on the table. And even if there are more notional jobs than actual jobs, people are still gonna fight for those actual jobs, right? Where we're at now is different, right? 100,000 workers have lost their jobs in the Alberta tar sands. Workers are being hurt in this moment, and the fact, you know, for a long time, the oil and gas industry was able to equate their interests with the interest of workers and say, you know, we're fighting for jobs and so on. But of course, they threw their workers under the bus as soon as there was a price shock. So those interests have now been severed, and it's an opportunity for us to build those alliances. I want to hold this document up. It's called One Million Climate Jobs, produced um, last year in Britain largely by trade union work, but by others as well, and points out that a different energy policy in Britain, a more sustainable energy policy in Britain, one that would help the uh, issues that we face on a global level, would actually be an economic generator, not a problem. It's a very good document. I urge you all to have a look at it and to read it. If we want a just transition, we will need jobs, many, many jobs. Climate is a trade union issue. We will need jobs to build wind turbines, solar panels, install them to ensure we go 100% renewable. We will need jobs in construction to insulate homes and build sustainable housing, to tackle housing shortage and fight fuel poverty. We will need jobs in public transport 
to shift people from cars into buses and trains. We will need jobs in industry, in education, waste, agriculture, water management. One million climate jobs in the UK over 20 years will cut CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions by over 80%. We should therefore be cutting emissions in Britain by 100%, not just 80% by 2050. We should commit to eradicating coal from an energy mix by the early 2020s. We are now going global with climate jobs, uh, with campaign starting or underway or quite advanced in Canada, Norway, South Africa, New York State, Portugal, Mauritius, the Philippines, the Basque country. The money that we need is out there. We just have to go after it. It's obvious. It's an end to fossil fuel subsidies um, that will give us trillions of dollars right there, financial transaction taxes, increases on fossil fuel royalties, higher income taxes on corporations and the wealthy, a progressive carbon tax. And by the way, it's a very good time to introduce one when the price of oil is down and cuts to military spending. In 2008, the UK found 800 billion pounds to save the banks. And in the UK, tax avoidance and evasion represent over 100 billion pounds every year. Let's be clear, if the planet was a bank, they would have already saved it. Just Transitions is an urgent call for an immediate and significant transformation process that moves us away from dependency on carbon-emitting poisons in a manner that embraces energy democracy. So when communities have control over the production and distribution of clean energy, that's environmental justice. There's a small group of workers down in the Philippines, 77 of them, and for the past two years, they have been struggling against privatization. And they did not accept the corporatization, the sellout of their cooperative, so they went on strike. But when they went on strike, it was very clear to them that they were not just fighting to regain their jobs. They were actually fighting to stop the, the, the energy barons in the Philippines to control the power industry. They're the ones connecting the, the people who have been disconnected by the corporation. And obviously, they're doing it illegally. Every time the corporation disconnects them, the, the, the union, the trade unionists who have been on strike for the past two years now will reconnect them. And so every time the corporation starts to cut again their, their, their connection to electricity, then it's the community now that stands up. That is the kind of power that we need to build with the community. What's so powerful about energy democracy is it isn't just saying state energy replaces private energy. It is about community-controlled energy democracy, right? You know, I mentioned a Swedish company that's suing the German government for 4.7 billion euros. That company is named Vattenfall, and it's a public company. In the United States, it was people's power that stopped the XL pipeline. In New York... In New York, it was relentless organizing, educating, and agitating that forced the governor to not only call for a moratorium on fracking, but to ban it forever. The climate justice movement is on a roll. We are winning serious victories against the Keystone XL pipeline, the Chi activists. <laughs> um, I think had a little something to do with, uh, with, with Shell's decision to pull out of the Alaskan Arctic for the foreseeable future and Stat Oil's decision just a couple of weeks ago uh, to do the same. Um, you know, in the Leap Manifesto, we call um, for no new fossil fuel infrastructure. It's time to build the next economy now. There are already alternatives being imagined at different levels. Energy democracy is one of those alternatives. Food sovereignty is one of those alternatives. The defense of the territories and the communities themselves is one of those alternatives. So now the question is, how can we bring all the, these proposals together? How can we bring all the struggles together in one united front to defend life? This is where the whole issue of the labor movement and the trade union movement and progressive movements coming together with all the environmental movements are actually saying one and the same thing. There is a limit to the level you can exploit the planet. There is a limit to the damage you can do. It doesn't have to be a threat to everybody. It has to be an opportunity for us to come together and do it together. Individually, you can't do it. Collectively, you can do it. We've taken the responsibility on ourselves to do something here and now.
to stop the destruction of the world's environment, to bring people together to prevent that happening, and above all, to bring people together, not through fear, but through hope, through imagination, through optimism. Unleash the optimism, unleash the imagination, unleash the hope. That is the way forward. Thank you.